Why do we work hard to solve small problems? Why do we reinvent ourselves and our clients over and over? And why are we giving away marketing strategy for free? It's time to bring home bigger paychecks. It's time to create the lifestyle we deserve and to make a greater impact. This is the Fractional CMO Show, and I'm Casey Stanton. Join me as we explore this growing industry and learn to solve bigger problems. Hey, it's Casey, and welcome back to another episode of the Fractional CMO Show. If you're a marketing consultant or a CMO or a VP of marketing or a badass marketing director, if you're a tactician who's really great at doing the thing that you've been doing, like copywriting or funnel building or whatever, and you want to move to the next level, you want to serve multiple clients and be a fractional CMO, you're in the right place. All right. So today I want to talk about a technical thing. Uh, and we have this weird responsibility as CMOs, which is in, in, in some instances as a CMO, you actually have to kind of have your foot in, in technology a bit. Uh, there's a lot of CMOs who come from a, uh, pedigree of like branding or PR and that's important stuff. And also those people tend to be a little less technical. Uh, that's just what I've noticed. Uh, maybe you're listening and say, hey, I'm a badass branding CMO and I'm really good at tech, then awesome. Cool. You're a unicorn maybe, but uh, that's awesome. Um, why is tech important? You know why tech's important. I kind of don't have to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyways. So tech's important because it, it we have tech-enabled businesses, right? Our, your clients have tech-enabled bi- businesses. These businesses use technology in order to do the thing that they do better. It's companies that don't rely on technology well, um, tend to do a lot of manual processes. I would much rather work with a company that was open to using middleware like Zapier to get stuff to happen than one who wasn't, right? You want a company that is ready to adapt to what's working right now instead of one that is just like not interested in technology. Um, one of the most painful things you might come across as a CMO is working with a company that doesn't have a CRM. Now, if you've ever worked with a company that doesn't have a CRM, it's kind of like, wait, what am I supposed to do? How would I know if I did it? Uh, A CRM is required, right? A CRM, a customer relationship management tool. It's the thing that says, Bob Jones is a customer of ours. He originated, you know, a lead came in at this point Ultimately, Bob bought these products, has a lifetime value of this. Um, you know, that's kind of like a minimum of, of what a CRM has on it. You know, then there's those companies that like use MailChimp as their CRM, which like, ugh, that's a little cringy, right? Like you can kind of get some decent information out of MailChimp if you query it and you have tags used correctly, but most people overuse lists and underuse tags and it's a whole mess. So you, you want to work with a company that has a good CRM. But there's this other thing that you want in technology. Yeah, you want like a central communication channel for everyone to communicate on so that like conversations don't just happen on text messaging and on uh, Signal and on Slack and on Skype and on Microsoft Teams. Uh, I've worked with a company that was on like four different communication platforms and then they had one team that only was on uh, text messaging. It was awful, right? Really tough to centralize that communication. Yeah, you want that tech-wise, right? There's other tech things that you're going to want. You're going to want to keep your eyes on things like the website and making sure that there's a backup strategy and you kind of run through some doomsday scenarios of what happens if the website goes down, how do you get it back online, all that kind of stuff. Yes, that tech stuff, yeah, that's important too. But in this episode, I want to talk about data warehousing. Data warehousing. Data warehousing is, um, uh, I mean, maybe like two years ago, it was like the buzziest of buzzwords. You know, maybe for like the last, I don't know, five years. Right now, I would say it's like AI, right? Chat GPT, that's what everyone's talking about. But let's just like talk about the validity, value, um, importance of data warehousing. What is data warehousing? Simply put, here's how I envision it. It's just one big old bathtub full of all the data. That's it. All the data that matters. So what data could matter um, to your client? Um, uh, Leads, including like lead origination with a timestamp. Like this lead came from Facebook on Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. Like that stuff's important. The contact record, right? 
with an email address, maybe other contact information like phone number, mailing address, any purchases that they've made, any sales calls that they've had. If it's a B2B or a B2 like high ticket C where there's opportunities in a, in a sales stage, meaning you're going to go work with Bob Jones, um, you get on a call with him and you have an opportunity to sell him a, you know, let's say you work with a client that does um, outdoor pools and driveways. Okay. Two kind of different businesses, but just for the sake of this, just stay with me. Bob Jones could come to this business, uh, you know, Pools and Driveways Incorporated, and there might be an opportunity created where he says, hey, I'm thinking about getting a pool. And then, you know, someone goes out and surveys it and says, oh, here's a $20,000, $50,000 pool for you. There's an opportunity created for that. And then that opportunity runs through its stages of um, needs analysis and qualification and proposal and approval and um, acceptance and waiting on payment and then payment made and then the project completed, right? That, that there's an opportunity for Bob Jones. There's also a secondary opportunity for Bob Jones, which is to get his driveway graded and paved, right? That's another opportunity. And that opportunity is only a $10,000 opportunity. And that might go all the way to a proposal stage and he might abandon it. Two separate things happening with Bob Jones, but you want all of that data, again, in this bathtub that you can query, okay? Um, the calls that Bob Jones has had, the emails that he's received, the emails that he's opened and clicked on. Think about all that data. You kind of want it all in one place that you can query. So what does it look like if you can't query that data? What it looks like is the salesperson is working on their cell phone and talking to Bob Jones and just calling him one day and then writing on a sticky note on his desk and say, I'll call you back on Tuesday. And then on Tuesday, he grabs that sticky note and calls Bob Jones. And all this is happening on that salesperson's personal cell phone. There's no record that the company owns that the salesperson is talking to Bob Jones. Uh, then there might be um, a sales process and the sales process might have a lot of manual components. Maybe they literally go to his place and they measure stuff and they have a whole, um, project estimating tool for how much it's going to cost to build a pool. And that project estimating tool might be the industry standard estimating tool, but it exists in a silo. It's like on a laptop that the person takes out to Bob Jones house and they measure everything and they kind of keep it on the laptop. And then they write a proposal and that proposal is in DocuSign. And all of these tools might be industry leading, high quality, great tools. They might actually make for a great customer experience. But for you, the CMO, if you don't have access to all that data and you can't query it, you can't pull any trends out of it. You can't figure out what's actually happening. You don't have an understanding of maybe the stages that people are in or the gestation from lead origination to purchase. Gestation is one of those metrics that is just like must be focused on for the CMO. Gestation, you could say gestation at different levels, but like it's the gestation of lead to sale, let's say. Um, there might also be the gestation of like um, needs analysis to sale, right? Like different, different points might have different gestations that you want to consider, but like generally speaking, that's a KPI that you should be tracking. Um, the data warehouse is this idea that all that data dumps there. So you're dumping it in somehow. Maybe there's API integrations, which is an application interface, which is above my pay grade. Um, and I don't really know uh, how to work with an API, but um, you know, you can go on Upwork and find great developers that know how to use APIs and just pull them in. Uh, but you want to take all of these different tools and dump them into that bathtub with all the data and then be able to query it with reports. There's different ways to do it. There's different... Um, technologies for this. There's some off the shelf solutions. There's some custom built solutions. It may make sense to do it custom for your client. It may make sense to do an off the shelf solution. Something like a Tableau uh, could be really useful if um, you can get the data into Tableau in a neat way. Um, you could even say that like Google Data Studio or what is it? Microsoft uh, BI, uh, Power BI. Those tools are kind of off the shelf, easy to pipe in some basic connections like Facebook ads, website visitors, purchases, events like that, and be able to pull some reports on the, the complete uh, customer journey. 
But those tools might also have some limitations. They might not be great for you. Um, if you're curious about and you've never used like Google Data Studio before, just go on Google and type in Google Data Studio template Facebook ads and just see what shows up. And what's going to show up is probably a pretty cool template that you just make a copy of and then you pipe in a Facebook ad campaign and it starts reporting on all the information for you every time you refresh it. So that could be useful, but again, the more steps along the sales, uh, the marketing, like the lead origination all the way through customer and lifetime value process, the more steps you have, the more complex it is going to be to get all of that technology to dump all of their data points into that bathtub for you to query out of. And that's the data warehouse. I don't want to prescribe to you a data warehouse solution because every business is completely custom and unique. Like everything's going to be different. I mean, two side-by-side businesses might, um, you might think could use the same data warehousing software and maybe they can, and maybe they can't. And maybe the difference is um, how they run proposals or maybe it's um, uh, uh, how they take payment or the CRM that they use or the ERP that they use or whatever. So you as a CMO need to, kind of hold this mental model of a data warehouse. And it's not enough to just have the kind of quick and dirty of MailChimp and just do the best you can. I mean, maybe it makes sense for the first few months that you work with the client, but over time you want to build a proper data warehouse. Um, If you look at ad tracking tools, there's two that come to mind, uh, three. So you've got Hyros, H-Y-R-O-S.com. You've got Wicked Reports. And then you've got, I think it's Third Whale. And those are three different tools that you can use to start understanding the uh, paid ad and um, social uh, posting, like social media posting and organic traffic and how it comes to your website and then you know your client's website and ultimately converts through different steps. Those three tools are interesting and might be a good thing to try on, right? Um, But the bigger the business is, the more a custom solution may be needed. And it's your responsibility not to know how to do it, but to know that you want it, to know that it's valuable, and to prioritize when it should be executed, when it should be built. And also, like, you should appreciate the cost of it, um, what you think the results are going to be with using it, and the timeline it's going to take to produce it. In my experience, there's a lot of modeling that happens and the models aren't good when they get started. There's like some basic models, which is like, what is the average gestation from lead origination to sale based on this traffic source? And that's a pretty kind of binary linear report that you can generate out of the box. No big deal. You know, you get enough data in there. You let it age for a month or two or three. You can start pulling reports like that. And those are useful. But if you want to pull deeper, more kind of strategic reports like, what would happen if we skip this sales call in the sales process? We know how much we pay right now for the sales team. Um, what if we remove this call? You know, would we actually experience a higher profit in the business? Uh, and is that, that an acceptable thing for us to do? And you know, those kind of questions. So data warehousing, again, is, is a tool in your tool belt, and it's a big one. Um, I would say like developing a data warehouse is right up there with you know, getting a new website launched for your client. Uh, from the outside, it's kind of simple. Uh, but once you get into it, I think it can be very hairy and very complex. And you should just have an appreciation of the value that a data warehouse can provide, of the value of the metrics, and um, if it's worth doing or not. Now, I can think back of working with a client years ago, back when I worked at an agency, and we had built out a significant data warehouse with Salesforce.com. It was awesome. They had the best of the best tech. I mean, I could cut my teeth uh, with those guys that I worked with that were just really great um, Salesforce developers, Salesforce administrators, um, and like data modeling folks. It was awesome. We created really cool reports. And then this this company that I'm thinking of, uh, they went through an acquisition and the company that bought them said, whoa, we're spending way too much on all of this slicing and dicing of data and we don't need it anymore. And they just killed the whole Salesforce org and moved over to a really simple CRM. So they went from having you know, like laser uh, x-ray eyes to effectively being blind on the data. And I remember seeing that company over the course of the next two years effectively fail. That was it. They like enjoyed the cash grab of reducing the um, technology spend. 
you know, the technology spend was something like 2% of revenue, which we thought was great for them and a really acceptable cost. And to the, you know, to the new buyers, they thought it was, it was crazy high. So we helped build a laboratory that provided insights to what ads actually worked and drove the customer and what messaging worked and lifetime value and propensity to buy and, you know, ease of sale and all that kind of stuff. We could model all of that stuff out, but it had a cost. And the question that you, you know, have to kind of weigh with this, the whole soft question on this all is like, is your client going to go for a data warehouse? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Will a data warehouse make your life easier? (laughs) Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a killer move. Um, if you can get it deployed and, you know, not, um, have too much of a headache with the developers that are putting it together with, with all these types of tech things, I would say that like 50, 60, 70% of the work is figuring out the logic of what you need. The development and deployment of the thing is not really hard. If you've ever worked on building a website, you know, that like, you know, hiring an agency to build a website, the website building isn't tough. It's like figuring out what the client wants and doing a page layout and like, what is the logic? What is the funnel that you want to drive someone through? What is the messaging? What is the core offer? Like all of that stuff is the heavy stuff. The actual building isn't a big deal. Same thing with data warehousing, like piping in a couple tools, mapping fields, um, you know, deduplicating by email address or by phone number. Like those aren't difficult things technologically, but don't go to that step until you fully understand the business logic. And it may take you months to define the business logic to get it right. And maybe you pull in a consultant that helps you. And then once you're happy with that logic, boom, you go roll out your MVP and you start seeing if you can model data in a way that's useful. We're moving into an ever increasingly um, complex environment for sales, especially online. It's just going to be more and more complex. There's going to be more data points that are going to be valid at different weights. Um, Someone in a certain title at a certain type of company may have a propensity to buy at a higher rate than another company, but a lower uh, affordability. Like these things are going to happen. We're going to get the data on that more and more. And you're going to be able to make data-based insights. You're going to know that you can scale a company because you can get a row as of one or a row as of two within one day or 30 days from your ad spend, or maybe it's 90 days. And Um, you start playing all of these different uh, simulations to figure out how to best grow your client's business. It's a fun, it's a fun place to get to. Um, Most businesses don't get there. You know, most businesses don't even do any conversion rate optimization. And that's like kind of the simplest thing to do. Once you have a, uh, a control, like a core offer identified and it's working, a little conversion rate optimization could double the throughput of it with like a couple tests with a couple changes in colors or uh, pricing or headline or um, formatting of a page or uh, adding a video or removing a video or whatever. So, you know, have a core offer, step after that, conversion rate, the snot out of it. So it's really high performing. And then start dialing in your data, start dumping it all in that big old bathtub so that you can query it and be able to pull meaningful insights out that are going to allow you to make better decisions. So we go back to the two things that fractional CMOs must do. One is solve bigger problems. Well, data warehousing actually tells you how people are buying, which is an amazing problem to solve. And then the second thing is delegate everything except leadership. That's, that's your other role as a fractional CMO. So how do you delegate this? Well, you say, we need a data warehouse. I want to hire someone who's going to come in, consult with us, meet with me a couple times, meet with the rest of the team, meet with the staff, whatever, meet with the sales team. And they're going to understand our full business process. They're going to lay out the logic. Once we agree to that on paper and a flow chart, they're going to then build this thing out. And then they're going to produce these certain reports for me that I think are going to produce this value. You solve that problem from a high level and then start um, kind of directing and orchestrating the symphony of people to support you and build out the data warehouse. You're going to find yourself in a position of power and authority because you're driving considerable change for your client. It's a beautiful place for you to be. And I'm excited that you're considering doing it. If you want help getting clients as a fractional CMO, if you want to build a practice where in your complete control, you are the one who owns your pipeline. You're not subservient to anyone who gives you leads. If you want to be kind of a sovereign leader as a fractional CMO and work a lot if you want or not a lot if you want um, and charge 3000 10000 15000 whatever a month 
per client and have six month, 12 month or longer relationships with your clients. I mean, being a fractional CMO is like the way to do it. It's, it's killer. I can't think of any other role in marketing that gives you this freedom, this leverage, this income. It's just a beautiful thing. If you want my help, I'd love to help you. That's the CMOX, uh, fractional CMO accelerator. We call it the CMOX um, accelerator. It's, a, it's, it's our accelerator. We help people become fractional CMOs. If you want to book a call with my team, you can. CMOX.co slash call. Super easy. Punch in your first name, last name, answer a couple questions. Give me your email address, your phone number, so we can follow up with you. And then you can book a call with my team. It's pretty simple. Um, we'll see if we can help you. We'll let you know very honestly if we think that you're in a good position or not. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of obvious, like people who have a lot of experience in marketing, um, oftentimes like can go out and win clients pretty quickly. Yes, that's true. And also there are the people who are committed to figuring this out. You know, I don't want to be a gatekeeper and say, you have to have 10 years of, you know, senior um, C-level or, or director level marketing experience, because you kind of don't have to, honestly, okay? And maybe this is going to ruffle some feathers. Um, I actually got an email uh, from a guy recently who was mad at me because I said that uh, a copywriter could be a CMO. Well, you got to start somewhere. And if you start somewhere, like let's say you are a copywriter and you're writing copy and you follow the greats, you follow the, the Garys, right? The Halbert, the Ben Savanga, um, you love copywriting and that's like your bread and butter and you've been writing copy. Odds are you probably understand funnels really well. You understand, understand the customer's experience well. You understand how to create an offer that is compelling that gets people to buy. And you know that that offer needs traffic. So you've done a lot of the CMO level stuff, which is like figuring out what has to get done to reach a certain outcome, including like how do you get traffic, who are the people needed, et cetera. There's stuff that you probably, you know, maybe don't know uh, that you need to get rounded out on, um, but you can move to an authoritative position as a fractional CMO. Absolutely. Then there's the people who are long-term CMOs who are leaving their... Um, their gigs. They're just like retiring or leaving or quitting or whatever, getting laid off. That's kind of the climate, you know, that we're in right now. Um, and those people want to be fractional CMOs and they're like, I'm a damn good CMO, but they might also have gaps. Like they might not really understand copy. If we just stay on the copy idea, they may not understand how to create a great compelling offer. You know, they may not have Hormozy's book on hundred million dollar offers. They may have never heard of Alex Hormozy, right? Like, that that's that's likely too. Um, sure, those 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 tenured CMOS have an upper hand in understanding how to work maybe with the C suite, but they might have some weaknesses when it comes to the actual tactics and understanding what the right tactic to use is. I've seen many CMOS who solve problems just by hiring agencies, which is an okay way to do things. But I'm a believer that you want to build your clients' teams up by like hiring full time employees and getting them to do the work. That de risks. Um, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't really de-risk. It just like reduces the cost for your client over time so that you can be more capitalized to drive ads and you know traffic that way and that kind of stuff. So there is no like perfect person who can become a fractional CMO. I think there's a lot of validity to people across the spectrum of marketers who want to become a fractional CMO. The one thing that they all have in common is a commitment and, and I mean, a commitment and an eagerness to learn and do and work and fail and fix it and keep growing. It's inevitable if you put your you know head to it that you're going to be successful. You might blow your first sales call. A tenured CMO who worked for Fortune 500 companies might blow their first five sales calls because they just they're just not dialed in. Uh, and also someone who's like, um, you know, a copywriter by trade might go in and just crush their first sales call and be able to win that client. Regardless, the our accelerator, uh, it helps you attract, convert, and serve clients. Those are the three things. Attract them, like bring in high quality people. Convert them, like how to, how to sell them confidently. And then how to serve them. What do you do in the first 30 days, the first 90 days? What do you do every quarter, every year? Right? How do you serve them in a way that gets them the best outcomes possible? So if you want to learn more, you can get a copy of my book, cmox.co slash book. It's a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. Or you can book a call with my team, cmox.co slash call. Or you can just like keep jamming these podcast episodes. If that's helpful for you too, do it. Uh, but if you're serious and you want to... Um, just like kind of take life, uh, take like control over your pipeline in your life, then 
just come in and join. Uh, we've got killer people inside that are doing incredible things, making great money, and we'd love to support you too. All right. Hope this lands with you. Um, shoot me an email back, grow at cmox.co if you want to share anything with me, uh, anything that you want me to cover. Otherwise, I'll keep sharing things as they come up. Take care. Thank you for joining us for today's show. For more information and episodes, visit our site at fractionalcmoshow.com. Go ahead and punch that like and subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. It means a lot, at least to my mom. 